Hello, and welcome everyone to this uh, project roundtable on how do we use video creation and sharing to shift instruction. Uh, today we're going to have the opportunity to really have a, a great in-depth conversation around using video in the classroom or throughout the school um, to empower uh, students and teachers to have more voice um, and to really expand uh, and deepen the learning, both for the teachers to shift their own practice and for students in order to shift the, their practice of learning. And so um, I'm really excited to, uh, to get going with a, a number of folks, and we should have a few more uh, joining us as we start. Um, but my name is Ben Wilkoff. I'm the Director of Personalized Professional Learning in Denver Public Schools. Um, and what I would like to share, and I'd like everybody else on the roundtable to share, is a story of how they have seen video shift practice whether it's for teachers or students, how have they seen video actually do that work where it wasn't just, hey, I threw together this thing and it now is on YouTube and it's been seen by 12 people. So um, I'm really interested in that. My story of sort of shifted practice actually came during the educational technology MOOC last year um, where I started to really think about doing a video blog, and there were other people who were very en engaged in this, this idea of sort of reflective practice through video. And with a number of other teachers, we started to create this, uh, this group of Fellowship of Open Spokes, where we would all have these conversations around different topics, education topics, and reflect upon uh, our work, and we started to see shifts as we went through. Um, and Christine, I think I'm just going to need to mute you at the moment, but um, we'll bring you back when we have the ability to do so. Um, and so from that, we were actually able to see um, coaching, and uh, my favorite role was actually the, um, uh, the school counselor who was using video to shape the way in which she was modeling for students. And I thought that was really powerful. So we saw that working through. So I'd love to hear from everybody else. You know, where are you in the world? What are you working on? And really, how have you seen video sort of shift that practice? Um, and I'm going to start with Doreen. Um, you got here a full 30 minutes ahead of time. So, you know, where are you? What are you doing in the world? And, and you know, what what is your entrance into this point? You know, how have you seen video really shape uh, practice? Uh, I'm Doreen Barnes. I am the Tech Integration Coordinator for Forest Hills Public Schools. Uh, we're located um, a suburb of Grand Rapids, Michigan, where it's, you know, lovely this time of the year. Um, and two years ago I was asked to kind of uh, be this person who formerly worked in the instruction office as staff development uh, coordinator and um, I was responsible also for gifted and talented. Um, but because of the surge of technology into our district, um, we kind of created a new department. That would be mine, kind of this instructional tech. And um, I would say what has really shifted for me is um, oftentimes my teaching staff, my adults that I'm responsible for getting on board, um, get nervous around technology. Um, especially if it means putting themselves on video. So I took a new approach this fall and I put, um, we, we've been using TechSmith products, but we used the uh, Relay app and the Fuse app. We put it on student devices that they were bringing in and we let students go to town with making the videos. That has shifted um, the teachers who have been immersed in it in a couple different ways. We are now tracking um, reading progress at the early grades, K1-2. Teachers are videoing their students um, as they read to, to see that. Um, at the high school we've had really kind of a profound um, shift in a few of our teachers and I think what's unique is the teachers kind of sit back and say, uh, oh my gosh, I didn't even know what I had gotten myself into. So they think it's video, but they quickly realize that they're completely transforming their classroom. So it's it's pretty awesome 
to so hear that I, I think that point actually is really important that they don't know what they're getting into <laughs> and that when you are looking at video as more than just this five minute thing that I watch cute cats on on YouTube about like that there is so much that's possible within it right but I don't know what I'm getting into and so I think at some point in this conversation I would really want to hear from some folks who are who are using these tools and thinking about well what is your suggestion then so that they do know what they're getting into so that they do see the power of what's possible and, and those kinds of things. Before we go on to the next person, um, I'd actually like to do a little bit of housekeeping here. So we have a collaborative document that we always use to take notes and to um, to get in contact with one another both, both before, during, and after the session um, and, and to do some reflection. So if you want to go to uh, bit.ly slash video roundtable, that right there is our collaborative notes document. The notes portion is all the way down at the bottom. Um, you can also use hashtag video roundtable on Twitter, which will allow you to take part um, within sort of the, the Twitter sphere where we're talking about these different things. I'm really excited to, you know, hear what people are thinking about in that space. Um, and just, you know, keep on collaborating as we go. There are a lot of things that you're going to hear that we're not going to hear and sort of vice versa. We'll try and call out some of the important points, but it's always going to be more beneficial if you are reflecting as, as you go. Craig, thanks so much for joining us. Um, if you do get a chance to turn on your uh, lower third, you can ask people in the chat how to do that if you're not familiar, um, but please do that so everybody knows who you are. And then I'm going to come to um, actually Crystal next. Um, so it looks like you muted yourself. If you'll unmute, who are you? What are you working on? And how have you seen video shift practice? Maybe. What do you think? I'm giving my teacher wait time now. <laughs> All right, Ralph. I'm going to give it to you, and then we'll come back to Crystal. Who are you? What are you doing? And how, what's your entry point? Oh. Uh, well, uh, I make videos uh, with educational content uh, with a product called MovieStorm. Um, the, it uses software, so that you don't need to use a video camera to make videos. Uh, the assumption, prevailing assumption, I guess, is when you're talking about video, that you have to have a video camera to get that done. But with software nowadays, you can make videos and not even need to use a video camera. So, Doreen, you were saying, well, you know, a lot of the teachers have problems with creating videos that might they might want to use for flipping their classroom because they, they're uncomfortable in front of a camera. And, and when they deliver what normally would be an excellent uh, lecture or presentation, uh, it kind of falls flat because they're nervous in front of the camera. So, with uh, using software, you don't need to video uh, the lecture, you can create the video um, through the software and avoid that. So that lowers a barrier to entry. Um, well, and I think that's actually really important, the idea of lowering the barrier to entry. And a lot of our tools now are sort of solely focused on lowering the barrier to entry, right? Like, we realize how powerful video can be only if you get to the point of actually creating something, right? So right. you're talking about creating video through the ability to... to almost um, sort of take the perhaps the voice and, um, and yeah, use the, the voice the the human voice or or the the human face out of it to lower the barrier to entry and movie storm is one of the ones that allows you to just type right no movie, movie storm uh, doesn't do the typing uh, text to speech uh, you use the person's voice Oh, okay. uh, they have it like an iPad app that's ten dollars so those of you that, that like to use iPads um, you could uh, record or somebody could record uh, the, uh, a live lecture and then you just take that audio file uh, and you load it into MovieStorm where you create an avatar. That avatar could be designed to look like the teacher if you wanted to do that or if you wanted to make the avatar look like a, uh, a, a historical figure, you know, somebody could, could uh, uh, recite a famous... Uh, speech or poem from a historical figure and then the avatars automatically lip sync the the speech to the, to so the, the audio and to the audio I think that's an interesting point around almost the idea of 
characters within video. Um, right. One of my earliest entry points was really thinking about who are you within the box of the video? Right. So are you actually the person uh, that you always are, or are you a character? Are you, are you sort of taking part in some greater work where you're sort of crafting uh, a persona for yourself or for a student, and you don't really have to be um, necessarily the same person within your screencast that you are in your classroom, and you know how do you how do you make that shift, and and really thinking about who you are within these videos. Um, thank you so much, TJ, for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, right now, a couple of folks uh, don't yet have their. Um, uh, their lower third on. If you want to try and turn it on, it's just in the Hangout Toolbox app, which is on the left-hand side. You click on that, and then if you enable it, there's a setting for lower third. It looks like a, a person with a circle around it, and you can do that. Um, thank you so much, Ralph, for that. Uh, Christine, I'm going to go ahead, and uh, hopefully we can unmute you, um, and we can uh, really start to uh, to hear where you're coming from and, and what you're thinking about. So I think... We can get that to work. Um, that you'll be able to sort of say, you know, how have you seen um, video really transform uh, practice? And I'm trying desperately to unmute you. Should we try? Should we try? Oh, it looks like you are now self muted as as well. So I want to make sure that um, see if you can turn that off. It's a beautiful smile. That's my favorite part. <laughs> So there's like a, a little ca uh, little carrot um, on if you click on yourself, um, as well as there's like a mute button all the way at the top. It's like mute microphone, unmute microphone, um, maybe. Muted now. Woohoo! Okay. <laughs> um, I'm a teacher in Pasadena ISD, which is in Texas. Um, I'm also a mentor for our new teachers that come into our school district. And we've been using video in order to video master mentors as well as new teachers so that they can improve their practice so they can see kind of how their teacher management is working. Uh, they can see good practice from mentors. So that's really how we've been using video. And so you're using it in a very different way. It's really not so much teacher creation or student creation. It's really thinking about the classroom environment, really sort of view, viewing the the classroom as sort of the stage almost uh, for the for the videos. And so how have you seen those videos actually impacting the teacher that you're videoing? Um, at first, they're very nervous. They are worried about seeing themselves on a video, but they realize quickly that, that they've missed things in the classroom. Like one half of the classroom they may not have focused on, or the kind of questions that they were asking to the students, they're able to reflect. They're able to reflect on, on their classroom management and determine which students are misbehaving, why. It's really affected their practice in a, in a positive way. Mm. That's huge. Mm -hmm. And and so thinking about the things that you are missing, right, and the ability to see them through video is really interesting to me. So I want to start to think about that. And as we as we sort of keep on going around, you know, if you think about it, you know, what are the things that we are able to see through video that we can't see in our classroom? Right, in, by just being inside of ourselves and only having our one viewpoint, right? So that to me is is really pretty engaging. Uh, Craig, I'm going to come to you. Who are you? What do you do? And you know, what's your entrance into video to shift practice? Good question. Let's see. Well, I used to teach uh, math and science high school um, in Adams 50 um, in the Denver metro area, as well as in Denver public schools. Been out of teaching for about four years, and I've come back to my original. Um, training as a software developer. Um, right now I'm working on a project called Flipasaurus, which is a video hosting product uh, specifically for flip class teachers and, and other blended uh, uses. Uh, so similar to what we were talking about before, enter, uh, 
lowers the barrier to, to not creation of video, but to storage managing and sharing video to students, uh, specifically trying to solve problems like, you know, what happens when a teacher needs a private library, what happens when, um, when YouTube's blocked, what happens um, at home when students don't have uh, a reliable internet. Are there ways to getting videos onto their devices to take home rather than expecting a like a streaming connection? So those are some of the pet projects I have. The other big pet project is sort of the reason I'm here is to think a little bit more about um, how students can submit their their video projects. So whether or not that's for self reflection or for um, just checking off uh, proficiency on, on whatever is being worked on in the classroom. That is, those are interesting reasons, but I'm sort of looking at the technical side, saying, you know, what, what does a teacher need from uh, from the technical perspective in order to do that? Um, some of the other things that um, that are interesting are our regulation, like we're like like was in the invite, the, the FERPA issues related to to privacy. Those often don't come up right now because, um, I guess, in my humble opinion, districts are sort of letting teachers kind of go for it and. And you know whatever happens happens, and I, if they're not a sanctioned video product, uh, overselling that a little bit. I would say that there are a lot of districts that are specifically not letting teachers go for it due to a lot of, of fear around some of those issues. And so yeah. I would say I would say there's a there's a huge opportunity here to dispel some uh, myths around you know what is possible what has to be done you know how do we deal with the sharing issues um, and I'm gonna definitely look to those of you who are specifically taking videos of children or having children take videos of one another and how public can we be with those what permissions need to be there those are some some conversations that we need to have and those are things that we need as a as a community to really solve for um, because I think that's that's really pretty important so uh, I really appreciate. Oh no, shoot! Uh, we almost had uh, <laughs> had uh, um, uh, who was it? Christine on? Uh, oh no, Crystal, um, who I was going to be able to come to, but we'll come to TJ. TJ, who are you? What do you do? And what's your entry point into video to shift practice? TJ. What do you got, man? I can come to Ann. I see your face. It's going back and forth. Oh, almost. We're almost there. I think there may be a speed issue. Hey, Ann, are you there? All right. Well, we're trying to solve some uh, technical points. Um, I do have a question from Kristen. She's asking about Movie Storm. Ralph. Um, is it the moviestorm.co.uk that you're talking about? Yes. Sweet. Um, that's definitely a, a tool um, that we are using. And uh, in the, the notes document, would you guys um, start to put in some of the tools that you were using for this? Um, I know Doreen had mentioned uh, Relay from TechSmith. Uh, Craig, obviously you use um, Flipasaurus as well as a number of other tools. Um, and Doreen is asking where the uh, the notes are. It's bit.ly slash video roundtable, and uh, the hashtag on Twitter is also video roundtable, so you can uh, post the link there um, as well as in the, the Q&A and what have you. TJ, how are we feeling about our audio right now? Not so good, I don't think. Anne? All right, Christine, so... How do you deal with these issues of uh, of permission? Like, do you just get this huge, like, acceptable use policy that you make everyone sign and their mother and and then just go for it, or what? Um, well, I'm a teacher. I'm not with... I'm, I'm not in a district position, uh, but our mentoring department has used that, and right now they're exploring what to do as far as FERPA and, and the regulations in that area. Um, but our videos right now are not being posted on outside websites. It's being posted on an internal platform, which we use SIBME, Seeing is Believing. And we use that as a collaboration between the mentor teacher and the new beginning teacher so that they can conference back and forth and, and, and work together. 
And so the idea being that you're actually using a tool that is sort of hosting the videos, but also allowing you to collaborate and have conversation about those videos. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Right. And so from the, the creation standpoint, what are you using to sort of create or to capture? Um, it's a variety of different platforms. We've used Android phones. We've used video cameras. We've used uh, iPhone, iOS devices in order to capture video, um, whether it's a short segment of time, if it's 15 minutes, up to some teachers are videotaping for an entire class period of about 45 minutes to maybe about 60. Wow, that sounds like a lot of video. And, and I think this is actually something that we, we struggle with is like, what's the right amount of time for a video? How, does, how do we make these sort of almost massive captures actually work to, um, to, to do some of the, of the shifting of practice? Doreen, I see you shaking your head there. Like, how have you dealt with this issue of, of sort of massive amounts of video? Like, there, there's no way that, uh, <laughs> that we should be using sort of 60-minute videos to, to sort of at, at one take because then we have to watch 60 minutes of video. So how do you, how do you break that down and make that manageable, or how, how do we make that work? Um, I actually discourage against uh, using longer stretches of video like that just because when we watch analytics of it, you pretty much see the drop-off occur. Um, I, I really strive for the five to eight minutes. Um, I'm famous for it in my district. I put out a weekly tech buzz, and um, my goal is always to stay under five minutes. Um, what I've noticed in the classroom is the teachers, I've kind of helped them um, develop a way to teach in bits and chunks like that so we can actually kind of chunk out the classroom. So instead of one 60-minute video, the teacher may make four or five, five to eight vi videos to share. So as students would go around a station, likewise, when our students are creating the content, we try to really tell them, I mean, and say to the students, are you going to watch a 45-minute uh, video on the jungle? Of course, they're not going to. So they pretty much, you know, come to their own senses, like, oh, we got to keep this short and sweet because we actually want people to engage in it. So in our, my philosophy is with video, less is more. If we really want them to use it, um, they need to try to keep it a little shorter. And so the idea of usability and sort of thinking about that, Craig, I'm interested in thinking about, so when teachers are creating video, um, do you feel like there is a, a loss of, of the teacher within that? Is there a loss of the art of teaching when they're creating video? Um, or is there something that we gain by doing some of those kinds of things? <clears throat> well, that's a, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, some of those really engagement tricks once you're more comfortable with your classroom, like mentioning a specific student's name while you're talking about the first law, you know, Newton's first law, and calling it, you know, Crystal's first law because she sort of discovered it three classes ago. And remember, we were talking about Crystal's law. Does anyone remember another name for that or, you know, bringing that in? You wouldn't really be able to do that with a video, um, especially if you're one of the flip teachers who really advocates for storing that video in a generic way you can use it year after year or, you know, in different settings or in different classes or in even different schools. So you lose some of that, obviously, some of those finer points of class engagement in the moment. But, um, I mean, things you can gain. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can gain um, besides just being able to reflect on what you did before. You can, you know, add, um, you, you know, what were the little VHF style pop-up videos where you can add, if you wanted to do post-production of your videos, you can add, you know, click this link if you're interested in learning more about Noon's First Law. You can um, you can say pause here and check your understanding and put up a piece of paper that has a quick question. Uh, you can, you can you know, do all kinds of, the way you distribute that video later can, can be greatly improved instead of having a synchronous up and down. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're speaking to at the moment. Um, I'm trying to manage some cats here. <laughs> well, that's important. That's that's actually the. I feel like the first rule of video is is managing the cats. Um, I, it sounds like we may have had a, another uh, microphone join us. Was that Ann or TJ that just joined us via microphone? Is it mine that works? Woohoo! Yay! <laughs> 
My video doesn't work, but my sound does. That's perfectly fine. Don't worry about that. So the <laughs> idea, though, of, of using these longer lessons versus these these um, sort of smaller snippets, um, you had some thoughts around that. How are you How are you sort of balancing uh, sort of the, the watchability of something versus the right. usefulness of something? Right. So I also use um, Sydney, which I believe uh, Christine was using as well. Yeah. Um, and I use them in a lot of different ways. So I'm the department chair at my school for science. And um, one way that I've used it, I've, I've created these different groups. And they're called huddles on the, um, on the software. And I've created different groups where they are the snippets of exemplary lessons um, on direct instruction or lessons on um, collaboration. I've literally just gone around my school and filmed like five to ten minute segments and uploaded them on the, on the platform so that teachers that don't have time to video or observe during the school day, they can watch those clips at any point in time. Um, but I also use it for full-on um, lessons. We recently did a lesson study um, in my department where we went through the entire planning process with one of our biology teachers. We planned the lesson with him. We reviewed his lesson plans before he started, and then we, we filmed his entire lesson, and then we've used that to make um, time-specific comments throughout his entire lesson. And then we're going to be reflecting on that in our department meeting in the next um, time that we meet. So they're so, able to see the entire cycle um, come to fruition in that video. And I think that's actually really important. Like The, the concept uh, that we lose something by breaking up the the um, the sort of the lesson cycle or or the entirety of a class mm -hmm. period into these smaller chunks um, and you don't see the continuity there. Exactly. I think you may lose something there, but I think what is transformative about what you're talking about is the ability to have almost a crowdsource reflection yes. on top of the lesson, right? It's not simply, you know, I'm taking this five-minute chunk and right. then, you know, one person is reviewing it. You're saying, we have 60 minutes of material here. Go in and choose your own adventure where you're reflecting on this particular element and then you're able to construct a reflection across all of it. To exactly. me, that's actually pretty powerful, right? Like, there, that is not something that we used to be able to do. Right. Um, and I think that that's something that, that we would want to sort of be able to, to sort of come um, and, and think about together. And, and it connects to me to a little bit of what Craig was talking about, where you're, you're saying, how is it that we um, allow for these sort of multiple entry points that we preserve? There's something great about best practice, right? And we want to emulate that best practice. But how do we make it then personal for the person who's viewing it? who is taking part in it, whether that's a student or a teacher. Um, so, Ralph, I want to come to you and think about, um, you know, how is it that that you are starting to uh, to really think about and 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 work within these, um, what you would say are are perhaps less personal because you don't have the the you know the person's face and things like that. How how would you say that is um, a more effective way of sharing because I'm intrigued because if we're saying that uh, that video can be a lot of different things right if you are taking the person out of it how do we make sure that we are still getting at what eventually would be best practice how are we making sure that students are are sort of a part of the the equation Ralph what are you thinking about well uh, uh, in a sense, you're not really taking the person out of it. Uh, you're using their voice. You're using their content. Um, you can. Uh, the only thing that you're replacing with the person is you're adding an avatar of the person, or uh, uh, and it, it also allows the creation of a video that is. Um, uh, you have more control over uh, what you're presenting, so you can. Uh, add uh, images to the video. You can add quizzes to the video. You can you, you wouldn't do the quizzes with Movie Storm. You'd do it with a, a third-party software like uh, Educanon. But you can uh, if you if you um, the, the students like to have the flipped lessons created by their own teachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way that you can do that and still allow the teacher to do it without having a, a live video camera presentation of themselves is 
to record their voices. And then you have the, way, the, the ability to be able to, uh, like you, uh, you were saying before, Greg, with uh, like a post-production, but it, it, in, instead of having a, a one-take video like they describe in, in some of the flipped uh, classes uh, lectures, uh, you can create the video on your desktop uh, with an audio file. And uh, to take it one step further, what I'm suggesting is that the software is easy enough to use that the students can learn how to use the software and they can help teach, they can help the teacher flip their classroom by producing videos of the teacher's content. Uh, they can use the teacher's voice, they can use the teacher's slides if the teacher has a PowerPoint presentation or something like that. And then they can, they can create the video within MovieStorm of the lecture and then it can be published. Well, and I, uh, so and I think there are a couple of things that I, that we're going to want to come back to. One is what do you do with the video after you're done, right? Like after the teacher or the student has created it or some outside person has captured it. We've heard about a number of platforms to use, and Educanon is one that I don't know that anybody captured yet, so if it's not in the notes, please put it there. But the idea of... Um, of actually, you know, how do we make it contextual? How do we build on top of the video so that the video may not be the thing? It's the questions that we ask about it. It's the context that we set for it. It's the, right. the way in right. which we use those things. Right. Uh, now, this is a question that I'm going to just ask uh, everybody to answer in one word. What grade is too young for students to independently create video? This is from Dana. Ralph? Well, uh, I have an example of a preschool student who created a video using the iPad app, and so it's, you on, think it's on the. No grade too young. Well, uh, or it was. I'm sorry, it wasn't preschool. It, at primary school. Uh, okay, so, so somewhere, so somewhere in the early grades for you. Early grades, right, right. Right, Doreen, right. what are you thinking? I have kindergarten make videos, so and I'm a K-12 district, so K-12 and up. That's awesome. Crystal, we're going to get your introduction because you're back and you're better than ever. What <laughs> grade? I would say I agree, K through 12, definitely. Nice. Fine. Greg, what do you got? That's a good question. I mean, on Flipasaurus, we've seen videos with kids that look like they're second or third grade, but, but it seems like they're doing fine to me. Okay, so second or third grade, that's where you are. Uh, what do you think, Christine? Um, well, I'm not at a school that does one-to-one, -one, but there are schools within our district that are one-to-one -one campuses, and I know that they use Flip Classroom. So I'm not as um, used to that, I guess, so I wouldn't know a platform for that. Or would you what grade would be? I mean, from your perspective, would you encourage the use of, of that kind of video for the same level of reflection that you're seeing out of, out of teachers? Because I, I know that I'm sort of stretching sort of where you are playing, but I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts around it because I see that it's related and I don't want to sort of sort of separate the way teachers are using video versus the way students are, are sort of using video. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'm next year we are going to be a one-to-one -one campus and we are going to be using tablets um, rather than netbooks, but I'm, I don't have as much practice yet with the flip classroom and, and how to use that. So that would be and, well, exactly. another and so, opportunity. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to collaborate with a couple of folks off of here. And, uh, and if you want to you know, talk with them afterwards as well. And you know, what are you thinking around, like, what is the age around uh, student-created video for you? Um, I think it's Nine, definitely like kindergarten eight, and depending, seven, I'm sorry, there's a eight, bell going in the five, background from high four. school. That was oh. like maybe a bomb. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, that's our warning bell. Sorry about that. Um, I would say as early as kindergarten, and depending on, like, the, I mean, honestly, the motor skills of the preschool student, like, I think a preschooler could do it. I use an app called Show Me. It's on the iPad. I don't know if it's on any other devices, but I know it's on iOS, and it's amazing. It's literally um, an electronic whiteboard where the students can record um, their voices, they can record their writing, they can input video clips, they can input um, um, PowerPoint slides. When I've had my AP kids create, when I create AP students, I have them like use my slides and they input those slides directly into the app. Um, and then they talk about it and they solve the problems. And then I also have um, 
Or they can also input their own pictures if they take a picture of something. Yeah, and I think that the idea of, of um, sort of allowing students to use teacher materials is actually yeah. something that's really interesting to me. So it's sort of building upon something that the teacher has created um, and, then, and then sort of creating sort of further knowledge where they're teaching one another. Right. Uh, Crystal, I'm really excited that you came back. So <laughs> glad to have you. Who are you? What do you do? And what's your entry point into video? Absolutely. Um, my name is Crystal Midlick. I'm an instructional coach in Hampton, Virginia. We're really close to Virginia Beach. It is beautiful outside today. I would rather be outside. <laughs> um, but I work a lot with teachers, and we've actually really taken on video this year to help teachers reflect on their practice. So with the individual teachers that I work with, I go in and help them to set up a video recording session of themselves teaching, and then they have a chance to watch that video, reflect on it. We have some different observation forms that we use to help them focus what they want to reflect upon and then we have some coaching conversations afterwards to really help them move forward with their practice and it has been awesome to see the teachers really have time to reflect and also to make changes in their practice going forward. Hmm. And so that level of reflection, so it, so this is something that's obviously very interesting to me around, you know, self-reflection, thinking about using video um, to, to sort of speak about what's happening in the classroom. But why is it that video is required to do that? Couldn't I just write down, hey, this is what I saw, and then I'm going to have a conversation with a coach about it? Like, why why is video required for that? Actually, I have, and I will send it to you, I have a video recording of an interview with a teacher for that exact reason, and they asked how she felt about the process, and she said it's in a way to look objectively instead of my viewpoint. So that way she gets to see what I saw, and she can have her reactions instead of, well, this is what I noted, and I wrote it down. So it really gives the teacher that lens to see it instead of through someone else's eyes. Hmm. And I, so I love the idea of being objective. It's very nice. You know, we can we can do that. Um, does it make it impersonal though? And and I, you know, like if we're saying, you know, I want the ability to to make it uh, more objective. Does it does it take the? And this is something that I keep on coming back to, right? Because I think that's one of the things that when we say we're using video, well, aren't you just replacing the teacher at that point? Aren't you just replacing the coach at that point? You know. Haven't we I just think made it's it a tool, but it, it doesn't replace anyone. The video is the tool to help you have that great conversation. But I don't think if she viewed it just on her own, I don't think she would get as much out of it. Knowing my coaching skills, I'm able to really help her to talk through it and reflect and really probe her with some questions and to help her to move forward from it. Like I think you mentioned before, you don't want it to just be a video that sits and you don't do anything with it. You want to have some sort of reaction to it and then a plan moving forward. And hopefully each time you video, you're looking for something different and you can have a different focus to help you move forward also. Mm. Really nice. All right, TJ, we're going to try this one last time. Do we have you on the audio? Hello, can you hear me? Woo! Does it work? Yay! I got Nothing it. Nothing but successes for us today. So, TJ, who are you? What do you do? And, you know, what are your thoughts around, uh, around this idea of using video to shift practice? So, I've obviously missed out on some of it, so I might be redundant because I've been dealing with technology, but uh, my name is TJ Hoffman, and I am also in Pasadena ISD, uh, along with Christine. Um, I am the Director of Choirs at Sam Rayburn High School, and I also serve as the Master Mentor for our campus. So I've dealt with uh, video in two different capacities. We use video both as an instructional tool in my classroom, um, and I have dealt with some specific issues regarding choral music education and using video in that context, which may or may not be interesting to some of y'all, but, uh, but it's well, I'm just going to stop you right there. I looked at some of your videos, and I noticed that you guys were singing D. Rayton, and yeah. uh, that was one of my favorite songs from high school. Um, so that was, I was, a, I played the bass, or not played, I sang the bass part, so I watched that video and I was like, yes, exactly, except you have better French pronunciation. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, but that actually is a perfect example of how we use video. So that is a, a pretty safe use of video, and I think pretty traditional. Uh, I just created a PowerPoint presentation and then recorded myself over it. One of the big things that we have to deal with in teaching music 
is getting the kids sort of the basic information of these are the notes, these are the words, these are the rhythms, but that's a pretty basic level of how we produce music, right? And um, But it's very time consuming. And so we're using video in our classroom to actually teach the kids that portion of the music so that when we walk into the classroom, they already know all of the basics of a song walk in and start fine-tuning all of the sort of musical elements and ducks and tuning and all those things. So that's one thing that we're using for, um, and I, I find that to be really interesting as a music educator um, because it's really getting us to a much deeper understanding, which I think is pretty much in keeping with the sort of flip, flip classroom format um, that you're getting the basic information out to the students at home and then they turn around and um, can display that information in classroom and then we spend the classroom time actually practicing and developing a, a stronger understanding of the of the material. So I think that's huge, right? Like our, our ability to sort of think about the classroom time differently but then also sort of reflect upon the classroom time differently. So um, at this point, I, I really want to bring a couple of the conversations together. Doreen, you came on early, and I wanted to, and I sort of talked to you a little bit about sort of my vision here is that when teachers are reflecting upon their practice using video, it shouldn't be totally drastically different than when students are creating video and reflecting on their learning. So how do we make those conversations not separate anymore? How do we make those cover bring those conversations together more in a way that says, oh, this is all using video to reflect upon learning and to reflect upon the way in which we learn or the way in which we teach? How do we bring those conversations together? And you don't have to have an answer, but I'm going to come to you because we broached that topic uh, early on. One thing I know that's we've struggled with a little bit in our district is the way we used to evaluate or assess students. For example, we always assigned the five paragraph essay. And now I have staff who maybe aren't assigning a five paragraph essay as a way to measure uh, student um, achievement. And um, maybe they've switched to an infographic, maybe they switched to a video or whatever it is. And one of the things that I feel like I'm spending a lot of time in, and I know, Craig, you just chatted this question, is, you know, we're still evaluating the same skill set, but we're also evaluating so much more. So one thing we're trying to do is take some existing rubrics, if you will, that we had, or um, whatever you want to call it, those grading scales, whatever, that a teacher uses, and then kind of apply those same concepts to the actual end outcome. Um, and they don't look dramatically different, but what I see on um, any of the in, any of the rubrics that we brought in um, technology via video or whatnot is a higher emphasis on our um, public speaking, uh, the the process end of getting to that final product. So I think similarly to what Crystal you were talking about with the coaching of teachers, we actually watch more closely the process that students take to that end product, much like we watch a teacher grow in her attainment or his achievement and um, and growth around technology. So I feel like what this is doing is putting us more in, uh, in alignment with the process that we get to that final product. Whatever the final product might be, okay, great, but we're looking at so many things along the way. I don't know if that exactly answers, but I feel that's where I'm really stuck right now in my district in this work. Well, and what it solidifies for me is actually thinking about the video not as an end point, but actually sort of a means to an end. Like the idea of, um, right, like, so Anne was talking about this, the planning cycle and the, and the lesson plan cycle, right? So, like, this is the process of creating the lesson. The lesson itself and the capture that we're doing is only really part of the story. It's all of the offstage work that really lets that happen. In the same way that the student has all of their offstage work to, before you get to the point of the video. And then to Ralph's point of what do you do with the video afterwards? What do you put on top of it to allow that conversation and the process to continue so that you cycle back? So to me, it's like that that process of before the video, the video, and then the conversation on top of the video, that's huge. Like, let's, let's make that into a cycle. Let's make that a, a larger part of this. 
So I want to come to the, some of the questions that are, are queued up uh, in the uh, in the Q and A here. And one of the big ones is around acceptable use policies or or different things like that. Um, would love to know if there are any really effective AUPs out there that people can share, including the permission and ethics of capturing uh, as student created artifacts. Um, you know, are they only binding for just my building, or could they be universal? This is something that even folks who did the Met project ran into. Some folks who were part of, uh, you know, a lot of the early flipped uh, classroom work, like they didn't get those things, and then they don't aren't allowed to use those videos anymore. Like, how do we deal with some of those things? Um, I'm gonna just throw it out to anybody who has sort of maybe tried to solve the, for this problem, or or has some thoughts around it. Well, I would think that if you used MovieStorm, you wouldn't have any images of the students or the teachers. And so you would be able to avoid all of that. It would really significantly lower your barrier to entry. So I like the idea that we can lower our barrier to entry, but you can't really do the lesson study using some of that kind of stuff. So how would we do, like, lesson studies, or how would we do some of the... Uh, because I think, you know, screencasting is one way of getting around it. And, you know, there was another question in here around platform agnostic tools. So there are now two different uh, Google Chrome extensions that let you screencast, Screencastify and the TechSmith um, um, Snagit uh, lets you do the screencasting using, you know, your voice and things like that. Right. All of these are right. possible. But what if we want people's faces? What if we want to see what the classroom looks like? Um, you know, how, how are we solving for that problem? I, I can speak to that. Do it. Okay, so um, the program that I was talking about earlier, Sydney, seeing is believing me dot com, um, has created a huge, I, I'm not exactly sure how to explain it, but it's an incredibly secure website um, where all of the videos, even of like, you know, even if you're seeing a video of a teacher or his child or whatever, everything is secure within your school's network. Um, and so it's not like it's being out and about on the Internet, like on YouTube or anything like that. And so you're letting the sort of the platform dictate then the sharing permissions. So exactly. The so I can invite uh, whoever I want. Um, I can block whoever I want. I can block people from – I can prevent people – so sometimes people can just view, sometimes they can comment, sometimes they can um, add and edit or whatever. Everyone, as the account owner on my account, um, I can dictate what everyone else is able to do in that particular account. And so I love that idea, and, and um, or I should say I love the idea of being able to decide how things, how open things are, right? Yes. And Doreen is also talking about TechSmith Re Relay, which is another platform for sort of that easy sharing of videos and, and sort of permission-based. I know a lot of people are using Google Drive as a way of, of sort of creating uh, layers of sharing permissions and things like that. But I almost think that we may be missing the point of how collaborative and open our classrooms can be if we're not trying to figure out and solve for the problem of open sharing of classroom practice and open sharing of uh, of video. So I'm intrigued by, yes, we can create our own walled gardens and that will work, but does that get at our uh, sort of solving for the problem of how we leverage, because everybody's essentially everybody is working on this, right? Like everybody's trying to be better teachers and learners. So how do we learn from one another in open ways if we sort of only have our own walled gardens? And that's a question out to everybody. How do we do that? Can you specify a little bit more? Because I feel like I can speak to that, but I'm like, uh, I'm having a hard time processing your question. Can you say that again? So let's say that I believe, um, so let's say I don't know who I want to share with. Right. I know that there are other teachers and other schools and other districts that could make use of this best practice that we have established here. Uh -huh. How do I go about sharing things in an open way so that I don't have to sort of only limit it to who I know? Oh, I see. So in the account on Simi, you can create um, something called a video library, and you can tag different videos. So like... I teach chemistry, so I would tag all my videos as chemistry. And if I had um, something about 
modeling lab setup. I could tag it with that also, and then I can invite people to view just those particular things. I could invite them to see my entire video library. I could invite them to a... I could create a specific huddle just for them, and I could put videos specific to them into that huddle. So they couldn't see everything on my account, just what I'm allowing them to see in that huddle. So do I have to know them to do that, or can yeah. I create an open link and then just link to it off of a web page? You, so you have I to be a potentially. Uh, I'm sorry. What? You have to be a part of the Sibby platform. Yes. So they would have to be no. Someone couldn't just Google something and and have access to what you posted in Sibby. Right. They would have to already be a member of Sibby to to have access to it. But anybody who was a member could see it. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's maybe not a walled garden unto its own district, but a walled garden unto the platform itself. Right. Okay. Exactly. So I'm gonna move off of the this topic here, and actually I wanna I wanna sort of do some some rapid fire um, kind of ideas here. But uh, um, if anyone figures out the acceptable use policy or the permissions, uh, would you just let us know and uh, and we'll we'll just sort of figure it out uh, uh, together. But I, I do think that that's actually a, an open question, especially if you're if you're looking at how do we how do we have those that are not platform specific um, to uh, to Dana's question. How do we have things that are more platform agnostic? Um, rather than rather than just looking at it from the perspective of you know I can only do it within here or, or something like that and I'm obviously there are some platforms that are much better than others uh, at that um, so my last question and this is for everybody and we'll go around the horn what is the one thing that you think a student should be doing with video and the one thing that you think a teacher should be doing with video to shift the way in which they are teaching or learning what is the thing that you believe they should be doing, sort of the next step? What's the next step? If you are talking to a teacher or to a student, what's the next step that you think they should be uh, uh, coming to? And TJ, I'm going to start with you. So I, I, we've already, the, I think the first step was the acquisition of knowledge and using video for that. And I think the next big tool that we can use video for is as an assessment tool. And I think both from a student's perspective and also from a teacher's perspective, it's the most efficient way to collect a tremendous amount of data for assessment from either students or from teachers if you're training new teachers as a coach. And so I think that the next step, the next place that we can go with using video past this sort of flipped classroom format is to use student, but use video to collect student data and use it as an assessment tool. Nice. I do think that that gets in some interesting things where, you know, from Sherry's comment, you know, when is video better than text? I could read something much faster than with video. So thinking about using video for the specific ways in which video is much better at conveying information and at creating new opportunities. So I, I think that that's huge, right? So uh, Ralph, what do you got? Well, I'd like to see uh, teachers uh, assign project-based learning activities uh, around the creation of videos that cover the teacher's core content. So the students and the teachers are working together to create that video that could later be used to flip their classroom. Nice. I like that a lot. Doreen? Um, for both, I think it's got to be student content that's being created with video. Um, kind of what TJ mentioned, I'm moving to the point where we're assessing student work um, based on the content that they're, they're creating digitally. Um, and for teachers, I mean, my push is for more and more video content, not necessarily thinking of the flipped classroom, like I mentioned before, as 60-minute you know, lessons but short bursts that um, kind of chunk it out and provide for a classroom that involves maybe more um, uh, independent learning on those areas. Absolutely. And, and the idea of sort of pushing folks to create more video then creates more opportunity, right? Like right. That, that to me is like, hey, just get started. You know, that's, that's something that, that we can encourage everybody to do. Um, Len was just asking the question, what's the platform you keep on talking about? It's S-I-B-M-E. Sib me. See is, seeing is believing me. 
which is, you know, kind of silly, but, you know, fun. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Crystal, what do you got? I just, I think there are so many ways I'm trying to narrow down, but I definitely agree with the project-based ideas for students. I think there are unlimited possibilities. This year my district took on one-to-one -one initiatives for fifth and seventh grade, so we're seeing how that goes. Every student was given an iPad, so teachers are really getting a chance to kind of explore the different options there with video and how projects can be produced. And then for teachers, we've created sort of a video bank for our district of model lessons that teachers can view and also model PLC, CLT meetings, but then also teachers are starting to create mini lessons that they can then upload for parents and students to view at home. We have some flipped classrooms going on, and then the video reflection for teachers. So we have a lot of layers of how video is being used. Are any of those publicly viewable? Because that sounds awesome. Yes. Uh, anything for the homework for uh, parents, those are a view the Yes, those are available online, and so are the flipped classrooms. Everything else is within just the district um, database. Okay. Would you put links to them in the planning doc so we can go and play? Yes. Awesome. Um, and just to the point before we move on from there, um, Dean had some great ideas on platforms um, using the iPad, and he's saying that they use uh, Nomia Teach and Explain Everything and Explain Everything just got some amazing updates so if you haven't played around in there for a while definitely check that out um, and then they share them via Drive which I think is really interesting as a, as a way of uh, sort of sharing either closed or in an open fashion um, and then they use Screencast-O-Matic uh, or even QuickTime on a Mac to, to record. Um, Craig, what do you got? Um, I just, yeah, I agree with with everyone, all the little pieces everyone's talked about, short videos, um, uh, some of the things that TJ was talking about. I, I, I have this tendency to want to really see kids you know, get up all meta on themselves, you know. Here's what, I, here's what I know at the beginning, you know. Do a TWL. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be that different than your, you know, what we learned in our you know, teacher training. Um, but can we record, can a kid record himself talking about what they know already about heat before we even have a whole unit on heat transfer? And then... Three weeks later, you know, this is what I said, and you know, even commenting on their own video and saying, "Yeah, I didn't have a real understanding of energy, and now this is where I'm at. And now I'm going to progress, you know, through the time I'm done with, you know, my 11th grade physics year or whatever. But right now, in ninth grade, this is my learning, and this is where I was. And so, you know, this can be can be something like an artifact that the kid transfers with them, you know, takes with them. But really, being able to say, here's the here's the growth I made in this unit, and you know, I don't know if we're ever going to get to that point." creating those type of artifacts, but that's sort of the dream I have in my brain. It's huge. I, I love those pieces of advice. Christine, go. Um, well, I know since we're wanting to be a flip classroom or have a one on our campus next year, we're going to start trying flip classrooms. <laughs> I know that some of them in our district use Nomia the teacher really uses that in order to teach in a flipped classroom after. Um, but as for a teacher appropriate just to help improve their practice and to be a better educator. And I think the focus on improved practice, I think by focusing on that and not so much on, hey, it's a video and those kinds of things, that to me is is really pretty powerful. So I really appreciate that uh, a lot. Um, Anne, I had to mute you because you were like moving around a little bit there, but if you can unmute yourself um, and and come back to us. Um, uh, are you there? Oh. I think we're in some place even louder. Uh, I do not have a fridge. Sorry. Anne, are you there? I'm giving you the final word. That's disgusting. What? I don't know okay. all of those things. <laughs> no, no explanation needed. No, no. All right. I'm going to just go ahead and we'll wrap here. So, uh... <laughs> So uh, thank you all so much for uh, for taking part in this roundtable. I'm going to give you the same charge that I give everybody that we do roundtables with. You are all now connected uh, to one another. Um, I know that you exchanged a couple of email addresses in the chat, but you are all connected to one another. Please do something powerful with this connection. 
collaborate over time and really create something together. So to me, that's that's where you want to go, hopefully. And my hope is that I get to to take part in this and uh, and keep on exploring with you. Um, if you want to do your own roundtables, I've created a way to do that. Um, where you can fill out a form and really sort of understand how to construct the roundtable, the planning document, it creates it for you and it puts it all on a, um, a planning document for your own uh, work and on a global galactic PD calendar that we're all going to start to use and, and create within, which I'm really excited about. So bit.ly slash create roundtable. Uh, is the link for that. And then if you want to get credit for either having attended or being a part of this, if you do a reflection um, and then you submit it to the peer-to-peer uh, -peer university badge, um, you can get credit for this uh, experience by reflecting on it. And if you want to do a video reflection, I feel like it would be the most appropriate time to do so. Uh, so please go ahead and do that. that that's the link, and I won't uh, do that, but it's also on the planning doc. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is the, the planning doc that Sherry uh, just put in there. She was responding to Tracy, um, but it's the short link is bit.ly slash video roundtable. Uh, again, I want to thank you guys so much for, for taking part, and uh, go and have a, a great rest of your day. Thanks, Ben. You too. Thanks, ben. Bye. Ben. All right, and then Sheila, the last thing was, are there any free or very inexpensive programs for doing green screening on a PC, similar to iMovie on the Mac? I actually do not have a good platform for doing green screening that is free. Does anybody have one that's still on the call? No. All right. So, I mean, I would say that uh, if you have a, um, access to an iPad or a Mac, um, there are definitely some good uh, uh, apps and, and things like that. There may be a Chrome extension that does green screening now that I think about it. Um, I'm not sure the camera the camera extension that they release, that Google released may be able to do that as well. So, All right, cool. I'm going to go ahead and stop the broadcast. Enjoy your day, guys. Bye.